Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. As we continue with this series in Revelation chapter 7, the focal point of chapter 7, I think, is the 144,000. Who are they? What do they represent? So we're going to dig into that. Uh, We're going to ask the question, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the question of who is Israel? Because I, I think that's critical that we examine that and we look at that as we seek to understand who the 144,000 people are. Um, I doubt that we will have time to get through the entire chapter today just because there is so much that I want to share with you in the lead up, Um, but probably in the next session we will look at the multitude, the great multitude. But first, again, let's go back and remember the premise of our study from the book of Revelation. Um, We are saying that the earth does not belong to man and that the earth does not belong to the devil. But we're saying the earth and its people belongs to God and that Christ is not only the ruler of the kings of the earth, but he is the redeemer, the king, the one who has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And thank God he's already redeemed you and me. But he's come to seek and to save and to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Psalm 24, 1 says the earth is the Lord's. Hallelujah. The earth is the Lord's. It doesn't belong to the devil. It didn't belong to Adam. Remember back in in the Old Testament when God said the land belongs to me. He's letting them live there. He says you can buy and sell and live and grow crops or do whatever. But the land belongs to me, and in the same way, the earth belongs to God. So he didn't give it to Adam. He did not, uh, and then Adam, therefore, could not give it to the devil. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He lets us live here, and he lets the sons of Adam do the things that they do because of his great love. Uh, But that love has a fierceness to it and a wrath to it that he will only allow man to go so far, and then he will intervene. And what we see in the book of Revelation is actually an intervention to destroy those who would destroy the earth. Not to destroy the earth, because the earth is the Lord's. He doesn't doesn't want to destroy, but to save. It's the devil who deceives the nations. It's the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So we've got to get the, get the, the, uh, the characters in this, final act straight and if if you're coming from the background from the perspective of many people you see the lord as a harsh judge sitting up in heaven raining down fire and brimstone and all of these terrible sinners uh, while we sit in the clouds and drink lemonade that's not how i see the book of revelation and um, that's not how i teach it because i just i just don't see it i don't read it that way i don't see it that way i think that way, that viewpoint uh, is is a poor reflection on the greatness and the goodness of God. And it, it really does not do justice to his plan and his purpose. And it really ignores the fact that in the very back of the book, the whole purpose of getting through all of that was so that there can be healing for the nations. So um, that's the premise of, of the approach. And if you change the premise, if you change the perspective, if you change the paradigm of how you approach something, it changes the interpretation and the meaning that you attach to it. So uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But you have the devil who is deceiving the nations here in the book of Revelation. He's exposed as a liar and a deceiver. He's creating a, a political system as well as a religious system to do what? To keep people in bondage to keep them in darkness, Paul says, lest they see the glorious light of the gospel so that they can be saved. How can they be saved if they are in the dark? So their eyes have to be open. And that's what exactly what it's, it, Jesus is referring to in Luke 4.18. He, 
He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And again, the earth and its people are the inheritance of Christ. And I'm giving you a new scripture, Psalm 2, 8, for your consideration. Ask of me, God says, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And he's referring to the Son, you know, uh, Psalm 2. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And that's exactly what we saw happening in Revelation 6. Uh, or Revelation 5, here's a scroll in the right hand of God, which I believe is the the will, the covenant, the title deed of the earth. And who is worthy to take that scroll and, and open the seals and receive the earth and the uttermost parts of the earth for their possession? Nobody is worthy except for one, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb who has prevailed, the, the son of God. And so... He is to receive the nations as his inheritance and the ends of the earth as his possession. And again, to emphasize and to illustrate again, God's judgments are meant to save and not to destroy. Psalm twenty two twenty seven says, All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. So we people never talk about these wonderful, tremendous promises in Scripture that talks about all the ends of the world will remember. All the families of the nations will worship before him. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. We, we just gloss over these verses as if they are poetry and we don't take them as, as prophetic declarations of truth. And we fail to balance them out with the record of the book of Revelation. Uh, there is wrath, but uh, and, and there is judgment. The purpose of the wrath and the purpose of the judgment is so that man will wake up, come to his senses as the prodigal son did. God, the, or the father in the parable, let that son go off on his own. And do what he wanted to do. And he he lived it up. He lived a, a rich man's life until all of his money was gone. And one day he came to himself. He awoke. He, he realized what he had done. And he went back to his father. That's what Psalm twenty two twenty seven 27 is talking about. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before the Lord. They're going to come back like the prodigal son once their eyes are open, but it's going to take some pretty severe judgments. And isn't that the case with you and me as well? Doesn't it take some really severe judgments and some really severe consequences in our life before we are reduced to Christ? And we come to our senses like the prodigal son and we go back to the father and say, Father, I'm not worthy. To be called your son, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And then he's received back in and he's, he is treated as the son has come home. So that is the purpose of chastisement, of judgment. Um, in Isaiah, it says that when God's judgments are in the earth, then the people will learn righteousness. Why? Because that's the only way some people are going to learn. And if you're honest, if you look at your life before you came to the Lord, assuming you have come to the Lord and not just come to a religious experience, but you've actually come into a relationship with Jesus, then there was certainly a period of time where you resisted the dealings of the Lord with you. You resisted the voice of the Holy Spirit. You hardened your heart against the things of God. And he let you go your way, but he drew you and he drew you and circumstances being what they are, at some point you threw up your hands and you gave up and you surrendered and you said, I, I, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son or your daughter. And 
God says, good, that's that's exactly what I was waiting for. Now come on in and let's celebrate our fellowship and let's renew our friendship and our relationship. Well, that's his goal for everybody. It's not just his goal for you and for me and for people who love God. It's for all the nations, all the families of the nations, all the ends of the world will remember and return to the Lord. So bear that in mind as we go through the book of Revelation, because it's going to get pretty intense and pretty difficult for people in their rebellion. We Previously in Revelation chapter 6, we made a comparison study of Revelation 6 with Matthew 24. And as we go, as we went through those first six seals, uh, we saw a very striking comparison between what John is describing in Revelation 6 and what Jesus is describing in Matthew 24. Um, So we saw the four horsemen, the white horse, red horse, black horse, pale horse, and then martyrdom, uh, the persecution. And it culminates in the end of chapter 6 with um, an earthquake, the sun is blackened, the moon is reddened, or the moon turns to blood, stars are described as falling to the earth, the sky is rolling up like a scroll. And so it, it we put out the the hypothesis. I, I, I'm not someone who's going to tell you this is the way it is, um, unlike others who believe that they have the truth and that they've got the exact interpretation. There's a lot that we don't know about the book of Revelation, and the, the best approach is not to pretend like we've got all the answers, but to share. Uh, my goal is is to share with you the things that the Lord has shown me and to give you my best interpretation of things. I could be wrong, but when I read the last few verses of Revelation 6 and I, I see this, this massive earthquake, um, something happens to cause the sky to become black enough that the sun would not shine and the moon would become like blood or the moon would become red. Uh, it's describing a smoke-filled sky or some kind of something in the sky that would that would prevent the light from shining. Um, stars of heaven falling to earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind, and then the sky receding like a scroll when it's rolled up. All of that, and 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 then right after that, it talks about the mountains and the islands being moved out of their places. This sounds like one of one of two things. It either sounds like a huge asteroid from out of from outer space hits the earth or it sounds like some type of a nuclear war or some type of a nuclear explosion. Um I lean towards the nuclear explosion thing because it seems to be the culmination of what we have leading up to it. It's uh, war, or it's a conqueror going forth to conquer, and then there's war, and so there's conflict, and and there's famine because of the conflict, and there's persecution. So there's some kind of war, and it could be religious in nature. It could be political in nature. Most wars are fought along the lines of politics as well as religion. But there's some kind of a of a conflict that... Um, doesn't affect the whole earth. If you look through in chapter 6 again, you see that that uh, at most, this is affecting a fourth of the earth. So when, And we said that even in this, here is the mercy of God demonstrated. It's not half the earth. It's not three quarters of the earth. It's not the whole earth. It's, it's a fourth. Still a, a large part, don't get me wrong, Still um, cataclysmic, but only a fourth. There's a limit. Uh, Jesus says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Uh, So this could be something striking the earth from outer space, or it could be simply that a, a conventional war with conventional weapons gets out of hand and there's a nuclear exchange. Not an all out nuclear exchange that destroys the whole earth, because that's the point. God will destroy those who 
are trying to destroy the earth. He's not going to allow the earth to be destroyed. Heaven and earth will pass away, but it will be the Lord who does that as he creates a new heaven and a new earth here in the end of Revelation. But there's, I feel like there's going to be something that is going to pave the way for this one world government and one world religion, this beast system. Uh, it's actually two beasts. One is a religious beast and one is a political beast. Both of them are inspired by the dragon who deceives the nations with politics and with religion. We'll come to that in later chapters of the book of Revelation, but this is like a, a preview of, of what to expect. Now, I lean towards the nuclear thing because of the natural progression of how wars are usually fought. And also because in verse in the last few verses of chapter 6, it says that the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And this is, this is exactly what military leaders and politicians do when there is a war or the threat of war. They have their underground bunkers and their mountain fortresses that they lock themselves up into in order to hide themselves from the from the threat of war and, and destruction. Uh, so I, I don't say all of that to, to scare you or to frighten you, but just to say that according to Scripture, unless you interpret all of this symbolically, and in some cases it may be appropriate to interpret things uh, and not take them literally, Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But it, it's hard to imagine that the martyrs of Revelation 6, 9 through 11, the ones who, who have been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and there they are, crying out uh, for God to avenge their blood, it's kind of hard to, to symbolize that and say, well, that's not really people who died, that's just... Uh, what, well, what is it then? <laughs> so if, if you do have to be consistent. If that is, if those are real people, you know, this is this is a real conqueror going out, a real war, real famine that causes real death and real persecution. I've got to think that the things that happen after that in the sixth seal, this all these cataclysm cataclysmic things that happen all at once, I, I got to think that they are actual events and not just symbolic of some spiritual upheaval. If everything else has been described, has been, as far as I can tell, literal. Um, and if you think about it, it would take, I mean, I'm, I'm sharing with you my thoughts now. It would take something drastic like that to, number one, create a power vacuum that would pave the way for people who want to have a one-world government and a one-world religion. Some kind of an event like that would certainly pave the way for someone to step into the vacuum and say, we need to take control here. It gives them an opportunity. Never let a, a crisis go to waste, as uh, one of them has said. Uh, so with every crisis, there's an opportunity for people to take advantage and to take power. Um, and secondly, with this this global thing that is very frightening, uh, it it also conditions people to want to put their trust and their faith in a system or a leader or someone who promises peace and safety. Uh, so if if you have survived uh, a nuclear exchange, uh, and it I don't know between what nations or how many nations, I just know, I just, my sense from Revelation 6 is that whatever this is, it affects the whole earth, and yet it is, the damage is limited. It's, it, it certainly, um, we will certainly know about it if a quarter of the earth is, is, under some type of a cataclysm. Uh, but if this was caused by man, which I believe it is, um, then it certainly 
prepares those who are left to say or, or to follow anyone who comes up with a solution to this problem. And I think the problem is going to be not just a political problem, but it's going to be a religious problem. I think the persecution of Revelation 6 indicates that this war is going to be not just along uh, political or geopolitical lines, but it's going to be around uh, religions. It's going to be a religious uh, and ideological war, not just a, a conventional war. And um, you don't have to connect the dots too far to be able to figure out, based on the news today, who that uh, who that might be, who the people might be involved in uh, carrying out a religious war with nuclear weapons. So, what do we make of all of that as we come into Revelation chapter seven? Well, again, if we compare Revelation seven with Matthew twenty four thirty one we see that this is the period of time when there is going to be a gathering together of the saints. Um, Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So let's pause right there and keep your finger there in Revelation 7 and turn over to Matthew 24. Now I've got it on the screen there, but it's always helpful to go back and look. And remember, we took Revelation 6 and we laid it right over the top of Matthew 24, and we noted how it is almost verbatim, uh, step-by-step matching in terms of what is being described. Um, So some people have said that Revelation 6 is actually a commentary on Matthew chapter 24 because it's so close. Well, it all comes to the sign of the Son of Man in verse 30 of Matthew 24. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And this is immediately, it says, immediately in verse 29, backing up a bit to what we were just talking about. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's exactly what John was describing in Revelation 6. Uh, So verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Uh, So even in that, we see a parallel in Revelation 7, 1. John says, I saw four angels angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. So even that is mentioned there in Matthew 24, that God will gather his elect from the four winds. So that's interesting. And then in uh, later on in 7, 9, we see a multitude, a great multitude, back in Revelation chapter 7, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 7, we're going to come back to the 144,000 here in just a second. But remember, if Revelation 6 and 7 is a commentary on Matthew 24, then it makes sense that Jesus says that he will send his angels and they will gather together his elect from the four winds. And then so Revelation 7, 9, after these things I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And then if you skip down to uh, verse 14, um, one of the elders had asked John, who are these people in the white robes? And John says, I don't know, but you know. And so he answers him. He says, these are the ones who come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, So we'll come back to the great multitude, but I want to point out, first of all, that 
most of your Bibles, the King James Version, New King James Version, most of the Bibles, um, are going to print in there the Great Tribulation. That word the is not there. That article, the, it simply says in the Greek, and it and I've got a, a snapshot of the Greek lexicon here so that you can see for yourself what I'm talking about. These are the ones who come out of the Great Tribulation, it says in King James Version. If you look to the to the right of this graphic, you can see the Strong's Concordance numbers, and you can see the actual Greek text that makes up this verse. And it, it does not say out of the Great Tribulation. It says, Ek Megas Thalipsis. Ek Megas Thalipsis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's three words, and there's no V in there anywhere. It just, it just means out of great tribulation. The word tribulation there, thalipsis, is translated tribulation, affliction, trouble, anguish, persecution, burdened, or to be afflicted. That's what these words are translated as. So the point is this. When, when you have a perspective of the book of Revelation so strong that Bible translations begin to add words to the verses to reinforce what, what people are teaching, then you've got a serious problem. And it's not only in, not only here, uh, some are, are really, really bad. They even capitalize the Great Tribulation because they're trying to reinforce this interpretation of Revelation that talks about the seven years of tribulation. And I just, I just point this out just to be a good Berean and just to, to show you why it is so difficult, perhaps, in your mind to overcome some of your initial reaction to the things that I'm saying and the initial reaction that you have to the things that you read when the very words that you're reading are being supplied by translators who have an agenda. They, they are trying to reinforce the idea of the Great Tribulation. When we don't want to add to the Word of God, I mean, if we do, if we comment on it, we, just, we want to be sure that people understand, this is just my opinion, and that's why I'm giving you uh, all of these disclaimers when I speculate on Revelation 6. It is my speculation. I could be completely wrong. Uh, when I'm when I'm right, I and when I'm basing it on Scripture, then that's one thing. But um, otherwise, I think we need to be very careful. So here, even in my New King James version, it puts this extra word: "These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation." Well, the problem I have with it is that extra word "the." It makes it sound like it's the seven years. Um, that you hear about all the time, uh, as the popular end times preachers will tell you. But what we saw in the book of Revelation, and then backing that up with Matthew 24, is that there has been, and and there, there never has been a period of time when there wasn't tribulation against the testimony of Jesus. So these martyrs here in Revelation 6, they've been going through tribulation for 2,000 years. We're going through tribulation now, many of God's people in, in many nations of, of the world, in North Korea, in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Syria, in Iraq, in Indonesia, and many other places around the globe right now. Uh, so I, I just point that out to you to be very careful and to underscore why sometimes it's difficult to grasp uh, looking at things differently, especially when the very Bible that you're reading has an extra word in there that kind of leads you to a certain conclusion. Um, so I'm talking about the translation. The translation can be in error, but the original word of God is exactly what it means. And so that, that's why I've got that screenshot there to show you. Another example is in Matthew 24, 21 where Jesus says, then there will be great tribulation, such as not, 
such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And it's referring to that same period of time. But look at the Greek interlinear on the right-hand side of this screenshot. It's the same expression. Megas, which just means great, and then thalipsis, tribulation or suffering or affliction. So my point is, let's not get into a dispensational doctrinal dispute about seven years of tribulation, but let's understand that God's people have been going through tribulation and suffering and persecution for 2,000 years. So let's talk about the 144,000. Who are they? Who are the 144,000? Going back now to Revelation chapter 7, and this is where we have to talk about who is Israel. Who is Israel? Well, as we go back, there's a couple of places that we can get some clues here. Going back to Revelation 7, Verse 4, it says, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. And of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Well, all we know from Revelation 7 is that these 144,000 are servants of God, it says until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So they are servants of God. They come from the 12 tribes, it it says. 12 tribes times 12,000 equals 144,000. And previously we've talked about the the significance of the number 12, and uh, 12 times 12,000, and we referred to the, the watchmen, the gatekeepers, the priests, the elders, in the temple in first chronicles that david set up but i want to not so much focus on the numbers and focus more on the names because i think that's going to be the the key to understanding who the 144,000 are uh, they are mentioned again in revelation 14:3 and i think we should turn over to revelation 14 uh, and and begin to to at, at least read the first 5 verses here so that we can get a better understanding of of who they are. In Revelation 14, 1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So that's the first clue that we have, or the third, I should say. They are redeemed from the earth. So uh, these are actual people. They're not um, angels. They're not heavenly beings. They're not symbols of of something else, but they're actually people. Now, the number may be symbolic. I don't necessarily think that it has to be a literal 144,000, but regardless, they are redeemed from the earth, so that means that they are people. They are singing a new song before the Lamb, and it also says in verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Well, that would mean that they are all male. So if you're taking if you're taking everything literally, then it's saying that women have no part in the one hundred and forty four thousand. That's why I can't take this passage literally. See, you look at things in the context. If in the context it supports literal interpretation, then you interpret it literally. If in the context it does not support a literal interpretation, then you look to the next level and say, well, what could this mean symbolically? Uh, So these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed 
from among men being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So we, we have a better idea, a better picture of, of who these are. They are redeemed from the earth. They are virgins. In other words, they are undefiled. They have not, I, I think, maybe it's not very clear right now, but I think as we progress through the book of Revelation, uh, you will see that John uses this idea of, um, of being defiled uh, in a spiritual sense. And we saw some of that in the letters to the seven ecclesias, didn't we? Where it talks about that woman Jezebel who seduces uh, my people. Um, so these are ones who are virgins. They are undefiled, meaning that they have not committed adultery with Babylon, as we will read about and study as the series progresses. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and they are the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, which is also significant, but uh, we will have to come back to that and look at it uh, at some other time. What I want to focus on right now is who are these people? Now, the, what you're expecting me to say is, well, they're Jewish because they're from Israel and because they are named uh, after the tribes of Israel. Well, at first glance, that seems to be the case. However, first glances, first appearances can be misleading. I, I want to take you through a an understanding here. Uh, bearing in mind that John is Jewish, and so he uses Jewish symbolism and and Jewish uh, teaching and and Jewish perspective throughout the book of Revelation. But bear in mind he is writing to Gentiles. He is writing to the seven ecclesias in Asia who are Greek, and they are not Jewish. They are believers in Jesus, but they are not Jewish. So you remember in the one of the letters in Revelation 2, 9, Jesus speaking through John and writing to the one of the ecclesias, he says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Now, at, at first glance, it would seem that it would be difficult to say you are a Jew if you are not a Jew. Jews are very distinctive in their beliefs, distinctive in their clothing, at least, uh, well, in some cases still today, uh, if they're Orthodox, but uh, particularly in the time of the early Ecclesia. It would be hard to say that you are a Jew and not be one, but Jesus says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So not all who claim to be Jews really are Jews. And this has some precedent as well. If you go back and you look at the exchange that Jesus had with the Jews in John chapter 8. Jesus, it seems, is more interested in the spiritual lineage of Judaism than he is the earthly lineage. And where do the people of this world, the people of the earth, what are they focused on? Well, they're focused on the land of Israel, the people of Israel, the temple. But Jesus is more interested in the spiritual lineage than the earthly lineage. In John 8, 37, he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. He's acknowledging the earthly lineage. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. He's a son of Abraham as well. But you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. In verse 39 of John 8, he says, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. He's telling them that you're trying to kill me, a man who speaks the truth that he hears from God. That's not something Abraham would do. In verse 44 of John 8, he says, You are of your father, the devil. In other words, you are a synagogue of Satan. You claim to be Jews, and you're actually Abraham's descendants, but you're not really 
God's chosen people, because you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. So we see here that Jesus is is laying the foundation for a spiritual family that is more important than the earthly lineage. And even John the Baptist, before uh, Jesus came along, says, Don't think, to the Jews, don't think that because you are children of Abraham, you will escape the wrath of come, the wrath to come. He says God can raise up children for Abraham out of these very stones. <laughs> but you see, the, the depths of religious blindness, it's all about the appearance. It's all about the lineage. It's all about the family tree. I'm part of God's chosen people, not because I love the Lord and, and do what he says to do with a pure heart, but because I can trace my lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, Jesus, just as he is so prone to do, is confronting the unreality of that. The hypocrisy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Well, if these people are not Jews and they are Abraham's descendants, then the question is, okay, well, then who really are the children of Abraham? And that's where you get into this new covenant teaching, Galatians 3, 6, and 7. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. What faith? It's the Christ-centered faith. The faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, this is the testimony that God has given us his Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son has not life. Now, Scripture says that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Well, then who is Jewish? Romans 2, 28, 29 says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, not in the lineage, not in the family tree, not in the borders of the land of Israel. But circumcision is that of the heart. It's in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God, whose boast also is not in men, but who boasts in the Lord. So who is Jewish? Well, not the ones that are outwardly who say they are Jews but the ones who were circumcised inwardly and that's also backed up who was circumcised Philippians 3.3 3. we are the circumcision he says writing to Gentiles writing to non-Jewish people non-Jewish believers in Jesus we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And he goes further. Because the Jews were coming up from Jerusalem and they were saying, unless you are circumcised and obey the law of Moses, you can't be saved. And Paul says, I tell you frankly, if you allow yourself to be circumcised, Christ avails you nothing. Because the whole point is not to be circumcised in your flesh so that you can boast in your flesh and have confidence in your flesh, but to be circumcised in your heart. We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Well, if that's the case, then who will inherit the kingdom? Israel thought they would inherit it. But Jesus in Matthew twenty one forty three says, Therefore, I say to you, referring to Israel, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. 
See, Israel was the unfruitful fig tree. And Jesus says, I'm going to take or the kingdom of God will be taken from you and will be given to another nation. What's what's the other nation he's going to give the kingdom of God to? Without a doubt, without a shadow of a doubt, the kingdom of God has been taken away from Israel. The very basis for this book of Revelation, at least a partial basis of it, is the destruction of Israel, the destruction of the temple. And the genealogy that they all boasted in and that they traced their lineage back, all of that was destroyed as well. I mean, completely wiped out. Josephus says that the destruction was so complete that a stranger walking through the land would not even realize that a city had been there. And in the meantime, of course, they have rebuilt it and they've even reestablished another country. But that doesn't nullify what Jesus says. I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So then the question is, who has God made a covenant with? Who did God make a covenant with? And everyone says Israel. That's right. He did. Who reneged on that covenant? Not God. Israel walked away from that covenant. And so it was necessary for God to make a new covenant. And in Luke twenty two twenty, likewise, Jesus, it says, took the cup after supper and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Hebrews, it talks about the new covenant, not the blood of goats and bulls, but the precious blood of Jesus, who offered up himself once and for all. So who did God make a covenant with? Well, he made a covenant with Israel, but Israel broke that covenant. And so God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with a new nation. He wanted Israel to be a chosen people, kings and priests. But now Peter, who is Jewish, by the way, 1 Peter 2, 9, writing to Gentiles, writing to believers in Jesus who are not Jews, says, now you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So I know the popular thing today is to say that The Jews are God's chosen people, but that's not correct. The chosen people is the chosen generation, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, special people, called apart people, chosen people. Now, I'm not saying Israel's not chosen, but I'm saying that all of us are special in Christ. All of us are chosen in Christ. All of us have been called out of darkness. That's ekaleo, called out into this ecclesia. into his marvelous light. So if you belong to Jesus, you are part of God's chosen people. So then the question is, where is Jerusalem now? Well, I know that there's an earthly Jerusalem, and Galatians 4.24 talks about the difference between the Jerusalem which is below and the one that is above. So watch this. These are the two covenants, it says. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. And is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. The Jerusalem above is free. The Jerusalem below is in bondage. That's part of the old covenant. The first covenant, if you will. But the new covenant is based on the Jerusalem not below, not the rebuilt Jerusalem or the rebuilt temple, if it ever happens, but the Jerusalem above is free. And where is the temple? Scripture says, know ye not, you are the temple. Again, where is Jerusalem? Revelation 21, 2 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, not old Jerusalem rising up from the earth, but New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Hallelujah. New Jerusalem. Not trying to restore the old. Not trying to preserve the old. But looking forward to a city that is made without hands. New Jerusalem. And it will be. They're trying to rebuild the temple and trying to preserve the old. Is what is going to probably trigger World War III. And most Christians are completely oblivious to the difference. Well, a new Jerusalem must mean a new Israel, right? If you have a new Jerusalem, you've got to have a new Israel, a new covenant, a new promised land, a new temple, a new everything, and that's exactly what we have. Revelation 3.12, Jesus says, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Jesus has a new name. What is that new name? Well, he will write that new name upon us in New Jerusalem. But the point is, old things are passed away, it says, and all things will become new. Everything is going to be new and improved. And that brings us back to Revelation chapter 7 as we begin to wrap it up on a positive note here. Revelation chapter 7, I told you it's interesting because all these tribes of Israel are named. However, these tribes are not named in the same order or even the same tribes as old Israel. So if everything is new, new covenant, new Jerusalem, new temple, new name, new kingdom, then we would expect new names and new tribes. And that's exactly exactly what we have in Revelation 7. And there is significance to this, and we will look at it. But first compare the old Israel. And the, the 12 tribes are mentioned in many places, but Genesis 49 is the best place to, to go through a sequential listing of them as Jacob or Israel blesses his sons and and his two grandsons but they end, they they end up as the 12 tribes of Israel Reuben Simeon Judah Issachar Zebulun Gad Asher Dan Naphtali Benjamin Manasseh Ephraim and there's also Levi which is never listed because Levi is a nation of priests. They are priests unto the Lord and they are not included in the 12. So the picture in the New Testament is Jesus at the dinner at the Last Supper with his 12 disciples and he is the 13th person there. He represents the high priest. But look at what John is doing here in Revelation 7 as he lists these tribes there's something significant in the way that he lists them. In the first place, we know that John is Jewish, and he certainly knows the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, and he certainly knows the correct order that they are in. So for him to write these tribes down and to change the order and to change the names of the tribes indicates without a shadow of a doubt, this is the new tribes of new Israel from new Jerusalem. So you see, there's a hint of the old, but it's springing forth something new and something very exciting. In the first place, all of these names are in a different order. In the second place, two tribes are excluded. Dan is not included in this list of tribes in Revelation 7, and Ephraim is not included in in this list of tribes. There are two new tribes that are mentioned, being Levi, which was a tribe but was never listed because they were the priests. But in New Israel, all of us are a kingdom of priests, and so Levi takes his place with the other tribes. 
And then Joseph is added as a tribe. Now, the interesting thing to consider, especially with old Israel, and why is this not, why don't, why don't we just accept this as these are Jewish evangelists, as so many people would say. They're the Jewish evangelists who are going to be preaching Jesus during the tribulation. Well, in the first place, only two of the tribes of Israel survived to the time of Jesus, Judah and Benjamin. The other ten tribes were lost. When Assyria attacked the northern tribes of Israel, they carried those ten tribes away, and they were assimilated into the Assyrian Empire, and they intermarried, and those tribes were dispersed, and they're gone. So the only tribes left was Benjamin and Judah, And they were eventually carried away to Babylon. Then they returned from exile. And so it's these two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. That's all that's left of the original tribes of Israel. But here we see John listing tribes, new tribes, in different in a different order, and adding the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Joseph while taking out Dan and Ephraim. Now there's different reasons we could speculate why that is, but I I don't want to get into that. I want to get to the significance of these names. So look at these names and and look at what they mean, and perhaps then it will become even more uh, exciting to you and really exciting when we get to the next slide. So here we have a listing of these tribes of what I'm calling New Israel in Revelation 7 and the order in which they appear. Judah means, I will praise the Lord. Reuben means, he has looked on me. Gad means, give good fortune. Asher means, happy and blessed am I. Naphtali means, my wrestling. Manasseh means, make me to forget. Simeon means, God hears me. Levi means, join to me. Issachar means, purchased me. Zebulun means, dwelling. Joseph means, will add to me. And Benjamin means son of his right hand. Now, if you put all of that together, perhaps we have a clue about what this new song is that they are singing in Revelation 14. It says that they sung a new tri- a, a new song that no one could sing except for them. If we take those names and we put them together and we write them out, perhaps this is the new song that they are singing. Now close your eyes and listen to this. I will praise the Lord, for he has looked on me and given me good fortune. Happy and blessed am I. My wrestling he has made me to forget. God hears me. God is joined to me. He has purchased me as his dwelling and will add to me the son of his right hand. Wow. Isn't that awesome? For lack of a better word. So perhaps that's the new song that it's referring to in Revelation 14. But regardless, we see that these names, these tribes that John lists... They are different from old Israel and taken together and arranged in a particular order. They make a statement all by themselves. That's really cool. Now, as we close, whenever anyone teaches the truth of God's word along the lines of Israel they will get accused of teaching replacement theology. Well, my understanding is that the ecclesia, or the body of Christ, or the church, whatever word you're familiar with, my understanding is the ecclesia has not replaced Israel. The ecclesia has actually fulfilled Israel. Just like Jesus didn't come to replace the commandments, he came to fulfill them. We haven't replaced Israel. We're actually fulfilling Israel's purpose. And it's not that 
the ecclesia has replaced Israel to the exclusion of Israel. But the fact remains that he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God does not have life. Now, because I know somebody will accuse me of teaching replacement theology because they'll be offended at what I'm saying and really won't understand why except they've been so ingrained in Hebrew roots that they're more Jewish than they are Christian now. But they're going backwards spiritually and they're going backwards prophetically. The Ecclesia hasn't replaced Israel. The Ecclesia has fulfilled Israel. Israel has has now actually fulfilled its spiritual purpose in the Ecclesia, but that doesn't mean that God, Romans 11, 2, that God has cast away his people. No, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Romans eleven twenty three says, And they also, meaning the Jews, if they do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. Graft them into what? Graft them into Christ. He saved us and grafted us into Christ, and they were cut off because they refused to believe. That doesn't mean we have replaced them, because it says God has not cast them away, but they also will be grafted in if they don't continue in unbelief, because God is able to graft them in. And in the end of Romans 11, it says that all Israel will be saved. So we haven't replaced them, but we are, in in a sense, the fulfillment of what God's purpose was in Israel. It failed outwardly, but inwardly and spiritually and prophetically, it's being fulfilled. God has fulfilled his promise to Israel. He fulfilled his promise to Abraham when he says that I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you and all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of you. He has fulfilled that promise by sending his son in the in the likeness of men in the in the in the cradle of Judaism and of Israel. Jesus, the Messiah, was born not and gave his life not only for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world, and not just for Christians who believe in him, but for Jews also who believe in him. So we haven't replaced them, but we have fulfilled them. And if they don't continue in unbelief, the door is not shut on them. God is able to graft them in again, and I've written a whole book on Romans 9, 10, and 11, that great mystery. It's called, What About Israel? So we're not forsaking, we're not casting them away, we're not casting them down, we're not looking down our nose on Israel because they don't believe. Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But at the same time, we're not going to glorify the natural Israel or elevate or exalt the natural Israel or set them apart as chosen people, when God says, I will take the kingdom from you and give it to another nation. And it is a nation that is not Jewish. It's a nation that is a holy nation of kings and priests, of every tribe, tongue, nation, kindred. And so, technically speaking, you do have to be Jewish to be saved. But, as we have seen, Jesus is more interested in the spiritual lineage than he is the earthly lineage. So, who are the 144,000? Well, the preterists will say that these are Jewish Christians who escaped Jerusalem before it was destroyed in A.D. 70. Sounds plausible, except, again, what about those lost tribes? If these tribes didn't exist when Jerusalem was destroyed, then how can these be ones who escaped Jerusalem? The futurists, the popular teachers today, will say that these are Jewish evangelists who preach during the tribulation. But again, what about those lost tribes? Where do they come from? If they don't exist anymore... So you really have to go through some mental gymnastics to answer these questions satisfactorily. I think the best answer and the most likely answer is that these 144,000 are a spiritual and prophetic representation of the overcomers. 
especially given what we know to be true about the tribes, their names, the order of their names, the ones that are included, the ones that are added, the ones that are taken away. All of this is with great significance. Have we tapped into that significance? I think we have. But even if we haven't, or even if you disagree with the interpretation, it's still noteworthy that it's even mentioned at all. So John certainly meant something by it. I think we've got the meaning. But even if we don't, it's written that way for a reason. And these are the first fruits connected to the Feast of First Fruits, which means the first of many more to come. So some will teach that only 144,000 people are going to be saved, and that's um, not too smart when you read the rest of the chapter, as we will next time, and discuss the great multitude, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So these are just the first fruits of that great multitude, which we'll dig into next time. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.